Hello. Hello. Man, that was precision. That was precisely, <laughs> precisely. I really want to get everyone into the habit that we fulfill your time expectations. Now, we might not record on the day that we plan to, <laughs> but or that we normally do, but when we say we're going to record, we want to uh, show up at the time that we said. So that was to the second. You're welcome. Uh, so I was, I've been talking to um, uh, Dustin over at uh, Oceanside OPT. Photo and Telescope. Yeah. And he is building a amazing setup for doing some live stream telescope fun. Uh, so he's got two telescopes, a gigantic, uh, I think it's a plane wave. Oh, God. And uh, and then like a beast of a refractor. Like it looks like 130 or 150 maybe. So these two telescopes and he's put color 1. cameras. 1.3 meter. No, is that what a plane wave is? When you say 130. No, no, 130 millimeter refractor. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes more one, sense. Or 150 refractor. No, no, the plane wave is I think okay. is only 20 inches. That's still I know, mighty good. I know, I know. And um and and then he's and then he is he is just for me put on color cameras, color CCDs onto them so that we that can get images excellent. just like that. And then they're both and then and there's multiple locations. So there's like one in California, I think, and one yeah. in New Mexico. So it's going to be just like the virtual star party like you've never seen it before mm -hmm. so uh we're gonna i think be playing around uh just trying to muck around with it so don't be surprised if you see me running some streams here or on twitch as i as i you know get in the cockpit and actually start uh, rolling so uh yeah it's pretty neat uh, man i just am having so much fun working with uh with the good folks at, at opt so yeah, they're they're kind of amazing, mm -hmm. and we're hoping to be able to. Now that I'm done having the plague, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're we're hoping to be able to start doing uh, actual observing now that we have good weather. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I mean Milky Way season is on its way back. The uh, we've had 26 degrees Celsius here, so it's just been hot. It's been great. Oh, it's we made it. We did it. So, all right. Uh, so, hey, I'm going to say hi to some people. Hello to Alex A., Arnold Post, Astro B., Ben Kalo, Bill Sugden, Capital H, Carolyn B., Chris Bamford, Coldfire, Colin Jones, Ilit Avron, Evan Stock, Stock, Stoke Dallin, uh, Gordon Dewis, Guido Bibra, Hal F., Harry M., Harry Patrick, James Averson, John Seffield, Quad Libet, Lars Rye Jepsen, Linda Sedik, Nancy Graziano, Paranor 001, Paul Smith, Peter Quinn, Peter Wyuf, Rinstro, Roman uh, Geber, Side MT, Tom Van Scotter, Will D, and Zap Van Zap Van. Hey, everybody. Oh, and then the other thing, of course, is um, we just completed all of the text edits for the Universe Today Night Sky book. So awesome. It's it's almost now locked in carbonate at this point. Speaking though, have you written your intro for it yet? No, okay. I got the plague instead. Oh, right, right, right. The plague. Now I remember. Yes. Otherwise known as I got a cold. I then got strep and being allergic to latex. Yeah. I, I gave I did myself in for an extra day because I slept with my phone next to me, not knowing my phone was in a phone case. I am now horribly allergic to. Right. Every you have to now look at your whole lifestyle and go, is anything around me made of toxic poison that's gonna give you hives? Elastic. Anything. Think of all the things in your wardrobe yeah. that contain elastic. Oh, like waistbands and oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. No, I don't like it. No, do not like has been pretty much the mantra of my week. Yeah. Um, okay. Are you ready to record an episode of Astronomy Cast? I, I think so. Okay. Uh, wait, hold on. It's showing the wrong microphone. Why are you doing that? Okay, I apparently have to restart Audacity because Audacity lost its little brain. 
you're definitely I'm using sorry. the right microphone for the for our connection. Yes, unfortunately, Audacity was trying to use something that doesn't exist, which was silly of it and not useful. Blue icicle. There we go. Okay, it's happier now. Okay. I have pressed record, and it is recording. Oh, I've also pressed record. Hello, Chad. All right, here we go. Our Sonic Cast, episode 489, Black Holes Update. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Great. I'm just mentioning in the pre-show, the weather has just turned. My tulip game is strong. Uh, it's just been it's like 26 degrees yesterday. I it, it just feels like all the happiness has returned to the world. Yeah, we're we're still down around 24, 25, but uh, there is the most amazing flowers out there. I'm I'm going to be posting pictures on Instagram, so uh, stay tuned. And I may actually up my Flickr game because I need some place to store all the photos I've been taking. Well, now Flickr's been bought, you know. I know, I know. It's now Smug Mug. Yeah, but, but, but Stuart Butterfield, founder of, of Flickr, posted on Twitter that he approved of the purchase. So I think you yeah. know a lot of astrophotographers still use Flickr as sort of one of the best places to be able to store all your photos. And it looks like they're they're under some good hands now as opposed to a yeah. drift under the, the Yahoo mantle. So I, I think it's a good move. So go ahead. I, I permit you to post your pictures. I, I shall do this right with on. or without your permission, I figured, but I appreciate it I anyways. I figured you might. <laughs> All right, another update episode. This time we look at what's new and changed in the research of black holes. And it's here that we find a lot of substantial new discoveries in the field. So much has been discovered since we first covered black holes. Ready for this? A decade ago. More. It's been more than a decade yeah, since we since we because it was like one of the first again, right? Yeah. When we started up Astronomy Cast, we went after all the low hanging fruit. So our first episodes are like extrasolar planets. Why isn't Pluto a planet? Uh, black holes, dark matter, dark energy, and here we are, four hundred eighty nine episodes into the show, and it's time to come back around and take another look at 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 black holes. All the things I enthusiastically said were true that we now know aren't. And the things I, I want to get to the things that you were skeptical about that actually are. So we're going to be able to see both sides of this. But please proceed. Where would you like to start on what's new about black hole? Do we have to even say what a black hole is? Do you think we can just skip right that part? Past that part. We, we, we probably need to explain it because we do have new listeners now and then. Okay. Uh, Briefly. <laughs> so, yeah. What is a, what's a uh, black hole? A black hole is any object that has smushed so much mass into such a small volume that you can get close enough to it that your escape velocity exceeds the speed of light. So the Earth is a person hole. I can't jump up and escape our planet from the surface of the planet. Now, if you like stuck me a couple thousand miles above the surface and somehow I was able to like jump off of a non-existent surface up there, I could escape and the earth would no longer be a human hole. That sounded wrong. We're going to move on. <laughs> Classic <panel>. But <laughs> But with, with, the, the, with a black hole, if you took our sun and you squished it down to three centimeters and attempted to stand on its surface, you would, first of all, be squished to death. And second of all, you could not jump off even if you were a photon of light because the sun would have become a black hole at three centimeters in radius right so all it means is escape velocity greater than the speed of light right and and actually at that point no velocity will take you away from a black hole even if you could go faster than the speed of light all roads lead into the singularity but you can't go faster than the of course speed not. of light yeah and even if you could it wouldn't help you so but yes, you can't go faster than the speed of light. But it might but, help you. But people always sort of imagine black holes as these, as you know, the name is terrible, right? 
Yeah. Because it's like whole. And and even when they show these simulations of what a black hole looks like and you see this sort of curved space time going down to the singularity, your brain thinks, oh, it's like a thing that you could jump into and then you would emerge in, I don't know, some kind of library that would allow you to see your whole lifetime and communicate with <laughs> Anyway, I'm not going to. I loved that movie up until that until part. That point. <laughs> um, spoiler alert. I raged. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's so the part I where Kip to... Thorne just sort of went, I am done with this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Um, so in our solar system, were we to suddenly squish the sun via alien means that we do not have uh, down to only being three centimeters in radius and somehow keeping it that size, then while it would no longer be emitting light in a way that is as useful for plants and humanity on our world, our planet would just keep on orbiting the way it's orbiting right now. Because orbits depend on the mass of the object, not the size of the object, as long as you're above their surface. So black holes don't go around eating things. That's just not a thing they do. Right. They wait for things to stumble into them. They're kind of the alligators of the cosmos. Yeah. And people always ask like you know when is the black hole in the middle of the milky way going to gobble up everything in the milky way and the answer is it's not going to no ever. and if no. you you know and as you said you replace the sun in the solar system with a black hole of the same mass and the planets will gladly orbit around it for billions of years and everything will be fine no problem it'll be very cold it'll just be there cold. will be yeah. problems yeah because <laughs> black holes make terrible stars um <laughs> so fine and there are a couple of varieties of black holes, a couple of flavors. Yes, yes. So I, we always kind of imagine that there would be this nice friendly continuum where you have the stellar mass black holes, which do exist. They do exist. These are what happens when your everyday overly large star that was either born that way or ate its companion, we don't care which, decides to go supernova and leave behind so much mass that a neutron star cannot form because the neutrons cannot push each other far enough apart. So we start with your everyday 30 mass star that undergoes a certain amount of mass loss and by the end of its life dies as a black hole or you take a white dwarf and neutron star and you radically eat its companion um, mergers, all these different things. However you do it, you can form a stellar mass black hole. And as far as we know, these things go up to tens of times the mass of the sun, uh, maybe a hundred or so times the mass of the sun. These suckers are found. Then we have also identified, and this is where I was so wrong the last time we did this episode. We have identified that some, but not all galaxies have in their core supermassive black holes that start to get to be like tens of thousands of times the mass of the sun. And Billions. Billions. Yeah, the, the exact mass is directly proportional to how big the bulgy center spheroid of stars is. So in our own Milky Way, if you look at it from the side, it has this large spheroid in the center. That spheroid is related to the velocity of the stars in that spheroid, and it is also related to the size of the supermassive black hole in the center. And we do not know which came first, the velocity, the spheroid, or the black hole. And they probably formed via chaotic processes at about the same time. Right. Uh, okay, great. So now everyone's caught up. And then now we're going to move into the what do we know that's new? And a lot of this in it is the search for other kinds of black holes as well, right? And and the realization of, oh, expletive, it turns out not all large galaxies actually have black holes in the center. Which Wait, is, so how were you wrong? Had you said that they did have them? We thought, we thought when we recorded the last one of these episodes that decade ago, uh, we thought that all large galaxies, and maybe even all galaxies, although the dwarf steroidals were baffling us, all large galaxies had supermassive black holes in the center. This is what we thought. Mm -hmm. 
we were wrong. It turns out that the super flat spirally ones that do not have a bulge, do not have this spheroid, the flat ones like M101, the pinwheel galaxy, appear to have absolutely no black hole in their center. So where do they go? Like, huh? like, well, I guess the question is, do we know why there are galaxies that don't seem to have a supermassive black hole in the middle of them? They, they seem to have figured out how to form in a much less chaotic way. Uh, this means that if the, the normal hierarchical way of forming galaxies where you take a couple baby galaxies and you throw them at each other just right and they become a bigger galaxy and then you throw in a few more baby galaxies and you end up with a bigger galaxy, it appears that if you do this just right, maybe, we're not sure, this is what we're guessing, you can end up slowly and carefully building a perfectly flat galaxy that doesn't have a bulge and doesn't have a supermassive black hole in the center. And the other thing is that they can have collisions with other galaxies and the black holes can get kicked out. That That's true, but if they'd had collisions with other galaxies, we wouldn't expect to see the amazing structure that we're seeing. So M101, for instance, the, the pinwheel galaxy is this grand design spiral with extraordinarily open, well-formed arms. It has extensive amounts of star formation going on. This is a dusty system that you wouldn't expect to see, sorry, killing the phone. You, you broke rule number one. I did, okay. I know, I don't do this very often now. Um, so you wouldn't expect to see this kind of grand design spiral without any bulge, without any warp to the, well, we, we aren't in a plane to be able to see if there's a warp. You wouldn't expect to see this kind of structure if there have been significant collisions in the past. You'd expect to see some sort of a puffing out. Our, our own Milky Way galaxy, part of the reason we have this, what we call a thick disk, this thickness to the disk of our galaxy, is from collisions that have added velocities, uh, added energy that puffed up the disk. So I guess errata update to our previous show. Most galaxies have supermassive black holes in the heart of them. <gasps> Most large galaxies, and as far as we know, all galaxies that have a spheroid structure have massive to supermassive okay. black holes in their centers. All right, what else is new? Well, uh, so when I started talking about uh, black holes, I said we have stellar mass, and I said we have supermassive black holes. Um, but there's this whole range of masses between 100-ish solar masses and tens of thousands to millions of solar masses um and in that hundred to one million solar mass range this is what we call intermediate mass blast black holes and um they uh are hard to find yeah but we're starting to find them but it's even fairly indirectly right like like you would i mean the place that they've been looking for these intermediate mass black holes is in uh, man, you guys have wrecked my brain. Globular <laughs> clusters. <sighs> Whatever. Come on, to... say it right Globular for us. Globular clusters. Um, yes. Yes. So that they have now, uh, they haven't necessarily seen them directly, but they've seen kind of, they've teased out mathematically that these clusters have to be in there, or that these, that these intermediate mass black holes have to be in there. And they're starting to find indications they may exist in really interesting places. So it looks like they might exist in globular clusters. As you were saying, it looks like they may exist in some of the smaller mass um, uh, baby galaxies. So when you're out there looking around, uh, 
if if you look at for instance the spiral galaxy galaxy ngc 4395 it looks like it has a 10,000 mass black hole in its center so this is where i corrected my earlier statement to say massive but not supermassive are being found in the centers of galaxies and this whole idea that globular clusters which don't really fit anything they're kind of their own weird creatures uh that they could also somehow be related to this spheroid mass function for black holes is kind of awesome uh okay so the hunt for and so i would say if we went back and sort of had this conversation about intermediate mass black holes 10 years ago we would have less evidence for them then. They would be, there would have been no observations, no data indicating that they're there. And now we have slight data that they're there, but no real smoking gun observations that they exist. No, yet. but the gravitational wave science is starting to give us tantalizing results. And, and this is, as I was mentioning, this is where I think the science has proceeded a lot faster than I think you had ever expected that it would. It's, I'm it's ready true. for you to recant. Oh, no, I'm not recanting. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll, we'll eventually there will be a time <laughs> when you will when you will recant. But until then, so let's I, about... I'm going to maintain that the first 10 years of LIGO funding. Yeah. All right. Was too early. All right. OK. OK. okay. So let's, I have strong let's opinions. talk about the amazing, exciting news of black holes colliding together. So I, some of the gravitational waves that have so far been detected thanks to the great expansions that have recently occurred to the global network of, of gravitational wave detectors, uh, they're, they're finding things that look like they can be explained through the collision of intermediate mass black holes. So this could be that that smoking gun for perhaps primordial black holes black holes that formed uh basically in that period of time between moment zero and the release of the cosmic microwave background which kind of sounds like you're releasing the hounds yeah. so that's now how i'm going to imagine the photons and so i mean obviously ligo with the gravitational waves they've i think they've detected five black hole collisions at the time that we're talking about right now uh yes this, the masses of these black holes are in the dozens of solar masses. I think the biggest is in the 30 range. So these are not intermediate mass black holes. And this is really just a limitation of what LIGO can do. It's yes. not that those those black holes aren't, aren't out there. It's just that LIGO and other instruments can't detect them yet. And, and people do want to kind of argue every time we start finding black holes through 30 solar masses and these multiple tens that maybe, maybe we could start to say that this definitely says that they do form this big. So this is where it's tantalizing evidence of larger black holes and a way to detect them in the future. And so is 30 times the mass of the sun, say, is that a surprising mass for a black hole that could come from a regular star? collapsing in on itself because i remember yeah way back to our supernova and we should totally do an update on supernovae um yes but um when i think about our supernova show that the biggest ones they just detonate entirely and that yes the, it, it, you only get those black holes from this middle range of sizes so is 30 starting to kind of break what we thought was possible yeah and the way it's breaking it is we know that there's these massive stars like the pistol star that form out of large, large, large amounts of material, but then they undergo huge amounts of mass loss. They are blowing these, sorry, they are blowing these high power winds. They are spewing matter out as they do this, as they go through their life, they're going to just keep shedding mass, keep shedding mass, keep shedding mass. When they go supernova, the part that becomes the black hole is what's left after you explode out most of your atmosphere and after you've gone through this few million years of, of massive amounts of mass loss. So the question is, and we're still trying to come to terms with mass loss rates, 
the question is how much mass can be retained by the end of a star's life and there's a few people out there that are arguing that it's going to be a number under 10. so this starts to be well what other ways do you make these big black holes and you could collide black holes together obviously yeah smush two black holes together and you get a bigger black hole and then smoosh more together and you get an even bigger black hole. And so it's not like what was surprising was the, you know, the millions of times the mass of the sun. How can you, you know, that for a while there, people could understand how you could get a black hole that big that quickly. And now yes. I think, and, and this is sort of one of the other mysteries that we had talked about, I know sort of midway through our run, this idea of like do, which comes first, the supermassive black holes or the galaxies around them because the two do seem to be kind of locked together in some way and now it really kind of looks like that mystery has been mostly solved that it is the bottom-up process as these galaxies come together not the sort of the, the top-down way so well it, it's looking like both actually so there is evidence that the earliest black holes not black holes well them too the earliest massive elliptical galaxies may have formed through a chaotic collapse process where it was turbulence in the collapsing cloud of material that allowed both sufficient cooling to allow that kind of a collapse to take place and also allowed the generation of the supermassive black hole. So if you're trying to figure out how do we end up with massive elliptical galaxies in the first few million years of the universe and how do you end up with all of the star forming galaxies that we see today, you need to have two different answers. And, and this is where it looks like everyday galaxies like our Milky Way are this bottom up, let's just slam things together gently conserving angular momentum and such things as that. But let's also allow within these dark matter halos to have this turbulent, fabulous collapse down to form massive ellipticals that died young, died fast. Uh, James Webb, should it ever launch, will allow us to hopefully observe these. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked about one class of kind of missing black holes that we're starting to see some evidence. The other one that was theorized is this idea of primordial black holes. Any yes. evidence for that? Well, so so this is where it comes down to what are we seeing with the, the gravitational waves. If you look at a list of all the black holes that were like, yes, that is a black hole. With a couple of weird exceptions that we're not sure about the data on yet. It appears that all of them except, yeah, no, it appears all of them that are bigger than 15 solar masses are detected through gravitational waves. And if by looking around in huge amounts of detail, we're finding things that are like seven solar masses, 10 solar masses, four solar masses. Um, but with gravitational waves, we're finding 36, 31. There seems to be this, this segregation in what's being found. So it could be that these 30, 36 solar mass black holes that we're finding through gravitational waves may be the smallest of the intermediate mass black holes that may have been primordial black holes left over from prior to the release of the cosmic microwave background. But what about the little guys? Like the ones the with the mass of a house or the mass of an asteroid? Yeah, we, we can't find those yet. Yeah. And this has yeah. been theorized to be one of the explanations for dark matter except now nobody believes that. Well, right. So the problem with trying to blame tiny baby, like <laughs> under the mass of the sun, black holes on uh, dark matter or blaming dark matter on them is if Hawking's was right, then they should be evaporating. And all the baby, baby microscopic, tiny, tiny, tiny ones should have gone poof early on. 
and the ones that are a little bigger should be going poof right now. We should see some kind of background radiation from black holes evaporating, and we don't see that. So We've never seen the right color of poof. Right. And so if they are out there, they are more massive, but less massive than, than black holes. Still a fascinating thing to be looking for. Okay. You know what would be great? A actual photograph of the event horizon of a supermassive black hole. How's that coming? Ooh. We're working on it. They took the picture like I know, almost a I know. year ago. And people won't stop nagging me. So It's I'm not going your to, fault. So I'm going to ask you, when do we get to see a picture from the Event Horizon Telescope? Not my responsibility. I'm just happy that Gaia dumped data yesterday. That is mind-bending. So yes. well, let's be, tell people what the Event Horizon Telescope is. And so maybe in a couple of years, we can give that update. Well, I... Uh, so a whole lot of astronomers pooled a whole lot of resources to simultaneously try, try being the optimal word, uh, to observe the event horizon of, of a telescope. Not of a telescope. That was stupid. Chad, please delete that to try <laughs> and There's observe. There's no way he's deleting that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> to try and observe the event horizon of a black hole. Uh, when they did this, they they were using radio telescopes. Uh, this, this was long baseline, very long baseline interferometry. You group together a whole bunch of radio dishes all over the world, different countries, different organizations, different kinds of telescopes. You very, very carefully record the time that you're observing where you are condemned forever to not be able to match up the images. You then combine all the data and you can only do this because radio wavelengths are sufficiently long that we can record them and actually track their modulation with the waves. So you record all the data, you then send it all to one central place. You do what's called fringe finding, which is aligning everything so that all of the telescopes are essentially observing the exact same incoming waves at the exact same time. And when you are done combining all of this data and you have yelled at somebody because their clock was off, you then have what is the highest resolution possible image for modern technological capabilities. Their goal was to look at Sag A star. This is the black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. We're still waiting. <laughs> it's And I mean, one of the challenges that I think is so great was that they used a telescope in Antarctica to assist with taking the picture, and they couldn't even retrieve the data from the Antarctic telescopes until the Antarctic winter had ended. And so that was in sort of mid-fall of 2017 was when they could even just get those, they could make the first flights to start carrying the hard drives out of Antarctica. Uh, and so now it's just a tremendous computational challenge to, to sort of pull this together. And I think it's yeah. important to sort of prepare people emotionally for what they're going to see. <laughs> and, and it's probably not going to be very much. So it's going to be a little blob. <sighs> That, that astronomers are going to be ooing and aahing over. I'm, I'm hoping it's more exciting than that. Uh, so we're, we're at, as we record this, just past one year from when the observation was made. And I know when I worked on my master's thesis, and admittedly, I was one dumb student because as graduate students, we all qualify at our beginnings as one dumb student. Um, I, I know I re-reduced my data multiple times and it was only at the end of two years that I was completely confident that everything was reduced in a completely consistent manner that could not be improved upon. They've had their data one year and they have data coming from multiple countries, multiple facilities that all have different clocks and I cannot stress how annoying it is when Even the clocks spacecraft. aren't the same. Yeah. yeah. And and so they have to master the data reduction process for all of these telescopes in a self-consistent way, then combine all of the data, do the fringe finding, the whole nine yards, and then decide that they like it enough to share it. <laughs> all right. 
Uh, are there any new interesting discoveries in the field of black holes that you wanted that you have dug up? For me, the big one has just been that not all massive galaxies have mm. black holes. I, I just can't tell you enough how weird that is that there's this this relationship between is there a bulge then there's a black hole is there not a bulge well how do you form that without the chaotic right. processes that lead to the kind of turbulence that give you a black hole i mean i think f for me i mean having reported on all of this stuff over the the last 10 years as well and a, and you know probably we have contributed a thousand articles to universe yeah. today about black holes and it's just like tiny little incremental interesting discoveries you know more evidence for intermediate mass black holes uh seeing gas that's about to fall into the supermassive black hole at the milky way as you said you know f starting to find out that there aren't supermassive black holes in other places uh obviously all the 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 collisions that were discovered with ligo so it's it's very much I think we're in this really mature stage, much more mature stage of the black hole side of being able to at least make observations of these things, which when you think about it, right, a thing that absorbs all light and, and energy and matter that falls into it, it's very hard and quite a technological telescopic feat to be able to to even see these things. So uh, just kudos to all of the astronomers that are making really um, great strides forward in just being able to observe these these things when it's such a tricky subject so and all the advances that are being made in gamma ray astronomy in x-ray astronomy it's finding that high energy light that lets us find these super comp compact objects so kudos to all of you who are collecting so few photons that you can name them yep. that are helping us find black holes in the process all right this was fun pamela we'll see you next week Sounds good. See you later, Fraser. Okay, everyone stay. We're yeah, just that's not saving. For you. That's just for the and, show. And I do need to leave five or ten minutes early because we're bringing in a new person. Okay, you just tell me when that is the, when, the, okay. when it is time. And say, okay. this is the last question. Um, we're bringing in someone so Peter... who speaks says black hole bomb at Fraser question mark. Are you are you talking about the Kurzgesagt video? Kurzgesagt. I do not know what this is, and I'm enjoying watching you try and pronounce this. Kurzgesagt. Um, they do they you know they do those great animations, and they did a whole episode on on the Penrose process and how you can steal energy from a black hole and how uh, efficient it is and how you can turn this into a really powerful bomb by enclosing your black hole in a mirrored dodecahedron and then zap it with light and the light bounces around inside sped up by the black hole or well, not sped up but it's it's wavelength gets shortened by the black hole so it becomes super powerful and then you explode it it's like a supernova that you can make but but like they let's not make supernovae this is no, an experiment no, no. i do not want to run but the but the <laughs> the, the great thing is like I, I, it's so funny to me that people want me to to essentially retell awesome videos <coughs> that these beautifully animated well narrated clearly a physicist was behind the research i, I can't yes. do a better job than they just did they rocked it they, they crushed it go watch that video it's awesome and all of their videos, they are the greatest, especially the video that I wrote. But no, no, that wasn't that wasn't their best work. Um, all right, let's uh, let's keep moving. Uh, Dane Covey wants to know what's the most important thing to come from Gaia. The DR two dumping of information that has everyone salivating yeah. and like killing their computers right now. Yeah, yeah, that. What's what what is the most important because I mean like yawn 1.7 billion stars one star is as yeah. good as another I I saw a um a HR diagram a color magnitude diagram 
that had more detail than any other color magnitude diagram I have ever seen. And the data, it like it just got here. We're still figuring out what's yeah. in it, people. So it's it's kind of amazing. And I just figured out something that may interest you and our audience. Mm -hmm. Our episode 500 is probably going to be in September, and we should plan something. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. By all means. <laughs> Because what we need is more things to to do, um, but yeah, I'm not no, I saying something like insane. I'm just saying a thing. <laughs> a we thing. should plan we should a plan thing. Something, something for episode yes. 500. That's true. Um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, sorry, I was looking through Astro year. PH. I was looking through Astro PH yesterday, and there were it felt like 20 papers from the Gaia team dumped onto Astro PH, and it was like. Here's all the star data. Here's all the neutron star data. Here's all the exoplanet data. Here's all the supernova data, gas distribution data. Like they just dumped mountains, not just star data, but everything else as well. So, so it's, I mean, it's kind of like you show up at some, you know, cornucopia feast. And someone within the first minute goes, well, what what was the best food that you had here at this buffet? You know, and you're like, I, I don't know. Like, give me like people are going to be digesting this data for a decade. It's, yes, it's an enormous amount of information and they're going to use it for all kinds of things. Hopefully video games. That's what really matters to me, that you have a nice, accurate star map when you fly your spaceship around. Arjun That's wants to know what kind of study of black holes yeah. teaches about the structure of the universe on large and small scales. Wait, say that again. I made the mistake of reading the chat at the same oh, time. What can the study of black holes teach us about the structure of the universe on large and small scales? Uh, well, if you're talking about uh, quasars, which are super massive black holes that have like all sorts of cool accretion disk stuff around them that is giving off a ton of light. Um, it like gives us an entire uh, way to navigate the cosmos. It allows us to trace out structures, at least with these pinpoints at the greatest distances. Quasars are supermassive black holes. They are the navigation beacons of the universe. Ben Appleby says, is a cold ice star as in the opposite of a normal hot star physically possible? A cold star in the vicinity of a hot star? Why wouldn't it be? No, no, just no, but like a star that is cold as opposed to a star that is hot. It depends on your definition of cold. Yeah. Like red dwarf stars are not that hot. They have all sorts of complex molecules in their atmospheres. Yeah. On the surface, it's a bad day, but it's not that bad of a day. And, um, and it also depends on your definition of a star. Yeah, brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs can be as warm as a cup of coffee. Well, and white dwarfs, which are dead stars, former stars, yeah. stars that were stars and are stars no more. White dwarfs can cool down to like touchable temperatures. They're well, just giant diamonds. Except they just smirch your hand as you try to touch them and they mm -hmm. absorb you with their immense gravity. But And they will eventually cool down to the background temperature of the universe. Mm -hmm. So there you go. So I guess it really just depends on your definition of star and your definition of cold. Yes. Um, oh, there was another question there, and I've lost it, and I will find it. Uh, Cerulio wants to know, can you talk about how black holes formed directly <coughs> from clouds of hydrogen just after the Big Bang? So is that a – Well – I mean, that's one theory for how yeah. those biggest black holes formed. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's out of the mixture of hydrogen, helium, and trace amounts of lithium and beryllium. We need to give credit where credit is due to the existence of helium. Uh, so there were giant halos of dark matter. And these halos of dark matter served as the seeds that had so much mass that things started clumping up. Now, the biggest of these seeds, once stuff started collapsing, it began heating up and it was 
this was a turbulent process. And with the turbulence, you end up with rapidly uh, spitting themselves back out bits of heat. So you have convective processes going on. You have thermal flows going on. It's a mess. But it's out of all of this that you are able to act to to um, flow out heat. I I lost a word somewhere. It's it's gone. You're able to to rid yourself of enough heat that you can collapse down small quickly. In general, you end up with this problem where as you collapse, you have heat, and you keep getting balanced between the heat that can't escape quickly and gravity which can't collapse against this hot gas pressure so you have to have the turbulence in order to get rid of the heat i heard a, a talk read the paper it was a couple of years ago that was a scrambled answer please forgive me google turbulent supermassive black hole formation <laughs> perfect i don't think i've i've had read reported on that so i have nothing to add except that you know people have theoretically modeled early stars from collapsed giant clouds of hydrogen you know those pop three stars and they yeah. could have been thousands maybe tens of thousands of times the mass of the sun and they would have just turned into they would have died very quickly yes and and who knows what kind of a remnant they would have left behind it's yeah it the ideas they're coming up with to try and explain how do you get giant things forming fast and then have stuff still forming today. Mm -hmm. All the thermodynamics turns out to be where the interesting stuff is hidden. Uh, Gordon is asking, when black holes combine, does the resulting black hole vibrate immediately after the merger? I have no idea. I don't know. I'm out. I'd have to go Googling and researching and reading. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like again. I guess that you have to even ask yourself, what does vibrate mean? Well, that I kind I of mean, can is understand. It be, is it going to be it, the the way I understand it? Is uh, do you have acoustic waves moving through whatever form of matter there is afterwards? Yeah, and can that even have any impact on the event horizon around it? Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. Okay. Cool. It's all right to not know things. This is why <laughs> we keep Appleby sciencing. wants to know if it was a mistake to cancel the mission to put an asteroid into lunar orbit. Ben asked me, but I want to ask you. What do you think? I have so many mixed emotions on this. It's always cool to make a science. Mm-hmm. It's never good to destroy the Earth. Right, but a pet asteroid, a, just a little guy. Right. You just keep, you know, out in lunar orbit. So, so I, I do think we eventually need to find ourselves a pet rock of the space variety that we bring no closer than, like, cislunar space. Somewhere out there between geostationary and the moon, I'm good. I'm good. It needs to be a tiny pet rock. Bigger than what we're bringing back from Bennu. Yeah, like but, house sized, maybe. Right. Um. I I'm not sure how I feel about doing it right now. Within the next like 20 years, I'm sure that this will be something that we're ready to do on a regular basis. But let's go out and like touch and pet and yeah. pick up small pieces of rocks first. Once we have more experience, like landing on and harpooning and all those other like slightly more violent things mm -hmm. then we can gently bring over a pet that we can like feed astronauts to elad wants to know if we've seen lost in space yet yes I've it's seen amazing the, i've seen the first three episodes and i keep watching you, keep watching it gets better promise yes mm, yes okay. it gets better all right Parker Posey, wow. That's yeah, all I've got to say. That's all great. Um, okay, all right. Just keep watching. It looks a little too much like home is part of the problem, of course. Oh, they filmed it in Vancouver? Yeah, it's all filmed in, you know, okay. clearly all filmed around, you know, my neighborhood. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> what? I can see where that would be distracting. <laughs> well, it's, it's so funny now. C Carla, you know, as we watch TV shows, she's like, oh. There it is, West Coast. 
yeah you know, she now that she's so familiar with the landscape here uh totally lucifer so have you seen the tv show lucifer it's based no. on the neil game and sandman series okay um so the view out of one of the characters windows is like almost the same view as David Joseph Wesley. And I'm like, oh God, they're filming like within a block of him. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, okay. I, I, I want to hear like one other person in the chat say Fraser, watch it. And then I'll watch it again. But I'm, I'm so okay. busy. I mean, The Expanse season three is happening. Yeah. Legion, which is super weird. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I, I need to like sit down. I like tried to partially watch back. Lee. See, I like to be able to binge things and I, they're not back with enough episodes to binge. Yeah. I've heard that Westworld really needs to be. Binge it has to be. Yeah. 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 So I, I'm waiting for all the episodes to be out. But when I was sick, I just like sat and I watched all of, of the, the new uh, lost in space in two days and was a happy camper and was Googling for when season two comes out. Okay, yeah, let's just watch it. Fine, Ben says watch it. Okay, done. I will watch it. We will we will put that back in the queue. Actually, I just finished watching The Terror, which is a series on a uh, AMC, I think. Don't and know. It's, it's a it's a retelling of a Dan Simmons book about Dan Simmons, the guy who did Hyperion, but it is a it is about the search for the. Um, the Northwest Passage, and it's super oh. good. Okay. Quad Libus says, I'm not your mother, and I'm not going to tell you what to do. So here we go. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, Jane so... Jamerson says, it sucks. Uh-oh. Now it's the balancing is starting to come. He, here was my problem with Lost in Space. The first episode was, did I mention this last week? Four levels of of recursive savory so like someone had to save someone so that they could save someone so that they could save someone so they could save someone it went four levels it was inception it was recursive inception saving. yeah it gets better yeah all right nancy says watch it. <laughs> fine and nancy has come around to things that i've said she should watch so in fact i think it was the uh or the orville uh, if you're seeing the chat that's going on here, that is, of course, provided by our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. If you want to join this awesome community, go to wshcrew.space. They will welcome you with open arms. They will teach you how to be an executive producer for this and the Weekly Space Hangout so that you can invite the guests that you want to see. Uh, and and you can sort of participate in this chat that's happening down here, both scenes. So and we would love Fraser to have you. And, I pop and we're in, in there, and you can hang out with us yeah. and yak with us. So. So I leave the Weekly Space Hangout chat up all day long. It has one whole screen of my four screens in front of me. So um, I, you know what? I'm going to make an executive decision. You've got to go. I heard your calendar go off. Yes, which yes. Which gave you like a 10-minute warning about yes. five minutes ago. So I'm going to let yes. you go. Okay. Let's wrap things up. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Uh Stay tuned for various announcements from me over the next couple of days because I am most likely going to start running tests live either on my YouTube channel or on Twitch to try to play around with these live telescopes. So, so stay tuned. All right, everyone. We will see you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.